Hey and welcome back. I've been asked by a few people about making some beginner's tutorials about machining. This whole hobby can be a lot to take in, especially if you're just getting into the hobby, and it can be very difficult to know where to start. So I think the best place to start would be with materials, given that there are a lot of different alloys and grades out there on the market, and it can be a lot to take in. And since I have the lathe and the milling machine currently pulled apart, I thought this would be a good time to make this video. Now this obviously won't be a definitive list, and the names and grades may depend on where you live and your exact metal supplier, but it should give you an idea of what I use in the workshop and why. So we'll start off with aluminium, which is probably the best starting material for the hobbyist. It's relatively cheap, easy to find in large quantities, and it's easy to machine, especially if you have smaller machines. Plus, it's a lot easier on tooling and quicker to machine. Now in general, my rule of thumb has always been, if I can make a part from aluminium rather than steel, I'm always going to pick aluminium, just because it makes machining it a lot easier and a lot quicker. Of course though, there are quite a few different grades and alloys of aluminium, and what alloy you have can make a big difference on how it machines and how you can use it. Now in general, at least where I live, most of the storeboard aluminium and extrusions and plate are going to be some type of 5000 series alloy. As a general purpose aluminium, it's okay, at least using it as plate and extrusions. But in terms of machining, I've never gotten good results from it. It always leaves a burr, it's pretty gummy, and it always leaves a pretty ordinary finish. But as long as all you need to do is cut and drill and maybe tap this stuff, it's going to work fine. Plus, it's always a lot easier to buy this stuff from the hardware store, rather than going to a proper metal supplier. The next alloy is going to be 6000 series alloy, which is probably the most common alloy that you're going to find when it comes to hobby machining. More specifically, the alloys that I run into the most are going to be 6061 and 6063. It's a good general all-purpose alloy, and it's easier to buy it in large sections, which is something that can be a bit more difficult to do with other alloys and metals. Now, I've used 6061 to make a lot of projects over the years, and I found it to be a good material to have on hand, but I generally find it nicer to mill it than to turn it, because breaking a chip with this alloy can be pretty difficult at the best of times. Unless your speeds, feeds and chip breaker are perfect, you're usually going to end up with long stringy chips, which can be dangerous if they get wrapped up and sucked into the chuck as it spins. It's for this reason why, at least for turning, I've switched over to using 2011 aluminium exclusively. It's a much better machining alloy since it doesn't create these long chips. It's also higher strength and hardness than 6061, but it's also more expensive to buy, and it can be harder to get in larger sections. Although that is going to depend on your supplier. The biggest downside for me though, is just that it is difficult to weld, and it does have poor corrosion resistance. But overall, it's a good alloy, and it's my preferred choice of alloy to buy. Of course though, there are lots of other alloys and tempers which I've glossed over, such as this sprocket which is made from 7075 high strength aluminium, but unless you really need the properties of these exotic alloys, you can mostly stick to 6061 and 2011 for 99% of your projects and you'll be fine. I'll also briefly touch on casting alloys, which only have three numbers to identify them, compared to four with the wrought alloys. Now, unless you're doing metal casting, you'll be unlikely to come across these, and in general, their mechanical properties aren't as good, so I'd avoid them. It should be noted though that these alloys are specifically alloyed in a way to make them respond better to casting, so if you're intending on casting aluminium, it's best to source aluminium which is intended to be cast. There are places online that will sell you pucks of casting aluminium, and it doesn't cost all that much. 
Alternatively, you can melt down things which are already cast, and I know alloy wheels are a very popular choice. It's also worth noting that when milling aluminium, it's best to use a two flute end mill, especially when roughing. The chips can easily gum up the flutes on a four flute end mill and stop it from cutting. Although when I do my finishing passes, I tend to use a three or four flute end mill because it leaves a better surface finish. Next, let's talk about brass, bronze and copper. Brass is a mix of mostly zinc and copper, and it is the nicest metal to machine. It makes these very fine and small chips, and it's very easy to get great surface finishes with it. Plus, you can easily solder it with a bit of lead and a butane torch. It's also a lot stronger than aluminium, though not as strong as steel. In the early days, a lot of my projects were made mostly of aluminium and brass for this reason. I used to use it a lot, but not as much anymore. Now in terms of alloys, there's going to be quite a few out there, but the most common ones that are sold to hobbyists are going to be C360 and 385, and in terms of their machining and mechanical properties, they are very similar. The disadvantages to using brass mostly stems from the price, which is to be expected due to the copper content, but it's also susceptible to corrosion, or I guess de-zincification, and it can also work harden very quickly, which can cause parts to quickly fail when put under load. Overall, definitely a very good material to have on hand when starting out. A similar metal is bronze, which is an alloy of mostly copper with some tin added. You can tell it apart from brass by the stripy pattern on the side, whereas brass doesn't have that. It's also a lot more expensive than brass because there's more copper in it, so I only use it when I really have to. Now unlike brass, it is a bearing material, which means it's commonly used for bearing surfaces and bushings. It's also a lot more corrosion resistant than brass, which is why it's used in a lot of naval applications. Now in terms of alloys, there are going to be a few different types of bronze, but the most common industrial grade that you're going to run into is going to be a phosphor bronze, as opposed to an aluminium bronze. Overall, it's a very useful material to have, but given the price, I only really buy it for those specific applications when I really need it. I also have a piece of copper which I was given a number of years ago, and the most I've ever done with it is make a tip for a soldering iron. Generally speaking, it's not a great material to machine, it's very difficult and gummy to machine, so unless you really need a part made from copper, I'd avoid it. Next, let's talk about steel, which is probably the most difficult category since there are a lot of different alloys that I use, and alloys can go by a lot of different names depending on your country and supplier, but I'll try and do my best. So let's start with no grade steel, which you can pick up from the hardware store. Generally, this stuff is mystery metal, but I found it to be pretty useful stuff to have, but mostly for things that require minimal machining, i.e. drilling, sawing, and filing. For stuff like that, it's okay to rely on the hardware store for metal, especially if you don't have a good metal supplier near you. It's not going to be the cheapest or the best grade of metal, but you definitely can get it to work. Now if you do end up machining it, don't expect much from it. It's going to be soft, gummy, and very hard to get a good surface finish with it. But sometimes that doesn't matter for some projects. Next, let's talk about steel that you would generally buy from a proper metal supplier. And we'll start with low carbon steel, which is steel with not many alloys in it and with below 0.3% carbon. Here there's a few grades and names that can be thrown around, such as 1018, 1020, grade 250, grade 300, mild steel, but as far as us hobbyists are concerned, they are all very similar low carbon steels. Now there isn't enough carbon in it to quench harden them, but with this type of steel, it's going to be good enough for 90% of the projects, or at least 90% of the projects that I do. Furthermore, it's pretty inexpensive to buy, and it's quite easy to find it in large pieces, 
something that is much harder to do with other grades of steel. Now it is important to note that you can usually buy it in two forms, cold rolled and hot rolled. Hot rolled is generally cheaper because they form it to size and shape whilst the metal is still hot and pliable and you can tell if it's hot rolled because it's going to have this distinctive dark grey mill scale on the outside and the scale can be easily ground off or weakened with a bath of vinegar. Alternatively you can get cold rolled which is more shiny in appearance and a lot of plate steel is cold rolled. Now because it's rolled at low temperatures, it's going to effectively be work hardened and that makes it stronger. You'll also get much better surface finishes when machining it compared to hot rolled steel. And the stock is also going to be much more true to dimension. Hot rolled is usually a bit squashed out on the side and a bit bigger than advertised, so you normally have to face it down to size. Of course though, cold rolling does cost a lot more than hot rolling, so you will be paying extra for it, but it can definitely be worth it. For me, if I'm milling it, I'll generally get hot rolled bar stock, but if I'm turning it, I'll get cold rolled, because I get a much better surface finish on the lathe. The next type of steel is going to be medium carbon, which is effectively the same stuff as before, except with added carbon, anywhere from 0.3 to 0.6%. A very common example of this is going to be 1045, and the extra carbon is going to increase the tensile strength, and it's also going to allow you to heat treat it. Now this stuff is medium tensile, but it is really good general purpose steel. Now even though you can heat treat it, you're not going to be making any knives from it. There just isn't enough carbon to get the edge that you would want from a knife. With that said though, it's a good medium tensile steel and it's relatively easy to get and relatively inexpensive. Another interesting thing to note is as you increase the carbon, it's going to make it a bit more difficult to weld. And that trend is going to continue as you add more carbon. Now what I have here is a file that's made from 1095 carbon steel. It has 0.95% carbon, which makes it a high carbon steel. It's the highest strength yet, but it's also going to be the most difficult to weld. Now because of that extra carbon, you can heat treat it to a high hardness, well over 65 Rockwell C, which is why it's very popular for people who want to make knives from it. In fact, when I type in 1095 and I try and buy it, most of the stock is aimed at people who are trying to make knives. In terms of me using it, it's not an alloy that I typically use. My supplier doesn't sell it, and what I can buy in Australia is mostly aimed at knives, which means it comes as a thin flat bar, which is not something that I would typically use in the workshop. The next type of steel that I want to talk about is one of my favourites, and that's 1214 free machining steel. Named as such because free machining steels machine better than any other steel that I have ever machined, at least on small equipment. Now generally there are two types, there's 12L14 and S1214 and not every supplier will stock both. Now 12L14 has added lead and sulphur for better machinability whereas S1214 only has sulphur. Now having used both, they perform almost identically on my lathe, and the only real difference that I can tell is that S1214, which my current supplier does stock, is slightly more weldable than 12L14. S1214 won't crack in the same way that 12L14 does. 1214 is also pretty poor at resisting corrosion. If I have a tub full of offcuts of metal, the ones that will rust first are always going to be the 1214 steels. So I'd always keep the parts that you machine protected. But if you have small machinery and you do want to machine steel, this stuff is definitely worth buying because of how easily it machines. As well as 1214, I should also mention 4140 Chromoly. It's well regarded as the go-to general purpose high strength steel, and for good reason. 
The tensile strength is almost double that of low carbon and it's relatively easy to find at most metal suppliers. And as well as that, it machines exceptionally well. Even if you have a small lathe or mill, you will be pushing your machines to the limit, but you can end up with some really good surface finishes. It's also pretty resistant to corrosion due to its chromium, but it's not stainless steel. The biggest downside is the cost. You're going to be paying about 4 to 5 times the cost for this compared to 1018, but there are definitely those jobs that need it, and this stuff can definitely come in handy. And speaking of stainless steel, in general, unless you really need to machine it, I would avoid it. They have a reputation for being difficult to machine, and it is a well-earned reputation. They do take a high cutting force to machine, and they have a tendency to work harden if you can't apply that load with your tooling. There is an alloy called 303 stainless, which has sulfur added to improve machining, but it's not all that common to find, at least with the suppliers that I use. The common alloys are going to be 304 and 316, with 316 being more corrosion resistant than 304, but it's also more difficult to machine. And unfortunately, my supplier only has 316 on hand. In the few times that I do machine it, I typically stick to using cobalt and carbide tooling, and I make sure to keep the cutting load as high as I can to prevent it from work hardening on me although normal high-speed steel will work. Overall, unless you really need to use it to help prevent corrosion, I would avoid stainless steel entirely, unless your supplier does stock 303. Of course, there are a lot of other grades of stainless steel out there, but a lot of them are really application-specific. So unless you really need them, you can definitely stick to 303, 304, or 316, and they will usually get the job done. Another metal that you might run into is cast iron. If you end up machining it, the chances are you're either machining a casting or you might be modifying a machine tool, and most machine tools are made of cast iron castings. You can buy cast iron from suppliers, but usually you might have to get it custom ordered in. Most metal suppliers don't have cast iron sitting around. Now there are a few types of cast iron, but I'd say 90% of the ones that you're going to run into are going to be a type of grey cast iron, which is the nicest cast iron to machine, as it produces these really small dust-like chips. So you don't have to worry too much about chip breakers, and the carbon itself acts as a cutting lubricant. It's also a really good bearing material, like bronze, but it's a lot cheaper, Plus, it's really good at absorbing vibrations, hence why it's used as lathe castings. I have machined a little bit of white cast iron, and that stuff is a lot harder and a lot more difficult to machine than grey cast iron. You can also scrape cast iron with a carbide scraper, and if you use it and a surface plate, you can get some very flat surfaces, which is very useful if you don't have a surface grinder or if you need to retain oil, such as on a milling machine way. Overall, cast iron is a really nice material that you'll generally encounter on cast parts, but it's very unlikely that you're going to order it as a piece of bar stock. The final material that I'll talk about are going to be plastics, and in general, I don't do a lot of machining on plastics anymore. And typically, I only keep about three different types of plastics in the workshop. Acetal, nylon, and acrylic. Now their applications are generally going to be very application specific, but I mostly use the nylon for the heads of my hammers, so I don't mark parts when I hammer it. With the acetal, I generally use it for light duty gears, because it is a very good wearing material. And for decorative stuff, I tend to use acrylic, since you can polish it up to a mirror shine and get it looking really nice. And that should bring us to a close. This should easily cover most of the materials that beginners will use, and it should give you an idea of metals and their uses. I hope this has been useful, I hope you learned something new, and with that, thank you very much for watching, see you next week.